Hello, and welcome back to the Chasing Poker Greatness YouTube channel. Sticking to the theme from last week's episode, we're going to continue talking about value betting today, but we've upgraded from Ace King all the way up to Pocket Aces. If you missed last week's episode on maxing value with Ace King, make sure to go back and check it out. Now, if you think that the best way to win a big pot with Pocket Aces is by putting all the money in the pot yourself, you're going to be in for a surprise. Stay tuned to see the tricky strategies that I employ to make sure that I'm winning the max off of my opponents with the best hand in No Limit Hold'em. Thank you for watching today's episode on maxing value with aces. All right, welcome to this aces themed episode of Tactical Tuesday. Everybody's favorite hand, or at least it should be your favorite hand. I, if aces isn't your favorite hand, then what are you what are you doing with your life? <laughs> um, welcome to Tactical Tuesday. What's happening, John? How much got? Got premium value this week. This is this is a, a rare, rare episode where we start out with something super, super strong. Um, unlike unlike yeah. last week, you know, these this hand looks good and wins very, very often. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's let's see if that is the case. Um, so everybody folds. Oh boy. Everybody folds to the small blind, who opens to three big blinds. You three bet to ninety dollars. They make it two hundred forty. You could jam. You could call. Tell me your your preference here. So, um, <clears throat> before taking preflop boot camp years ago, the first iteration of preflop boot camp, I used to just five bet jam these spots with aces, and I just thought that that was like. I just thought that that was standard. That was like the only the only option that I have. It's like, well, yeah, like you know, this is the best hand that I have. Free flop. This, you know, hopefully this guy's a good hit, and we just we just cooler him. Um, one thing that I learned in pre flop bootcamp uh, back when I took it was that aces is actually one of the best hands to flat in position, facing an out of position four bet. Um, so it's something that I started doing after kind of learning preflop and this is something that you'll see not only in preflop bootcamp but also if you look at like solve gto ranges and and all that and i think that kind of the um if i can like explain like the logic behind why aces plays really real well as a flat in these spots is that a lot of the hands that you're hoping to cooler preflop you usually end up coolering them anyways unless something bad happens and usually the bad thing here is flopping pop set and not getting a stack out of like kings or queens or jacks or something like that um, but the flip side is that sometimes you flop top set and now you still stack hands like, you know, ace king, ace queen offsuit, that's bluffing. Um, and I think the real value, like, you know, that that's a big part of the value of flatting aces here. But I think the real value comes um from when you're playing versus uh just strong regs who have a good four bet out of position strategy. Um, you allow them to just blast off with their four bet bluffs. And I think the stronger the player is, the more likely they are they are to hit their four bet bluffing frequencies pre-flop with hands like, you know, King Jack suited here or, you know, Ace 10 off suit or Ace 5 suited, stuff like that. Um, and at a, a very low SPR, which is going to be the case when you flat the four bet here, with a hand that doesn't need any protection like Aces, you're not worried about any over cards or really any type of board texture. Um, you can just kind of max value versus both parts of their range, their bluffing range and their value range so often that, um, yeah, this is just kind of one of the things that I wanted to bring to this Aces episode of PPH where it's like, hey, this is actually like one of the better hands to trap and flat in position preflop instead of just sticking it in um, every single time, which is which is what I used to do. And I'm sure that there are, you know, a lot of listeners here that do, too that just, you know, get really excited about getting four bet when they have Aces and stick this into their jamming range. But um, hopefully this episode or this this hand this part of this episode will just be a good illustration as to how powerful flatting and and how much value you can you can get out of trapping these hands pre flop. Yeah, the the only thing that I would like to you know address is PPH like poker power. Where are you right now, John? We're the the listeners at PPH. This guy. For, uh, I didn't just for, listeners for 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 those for those of you that are listening right now if you're listening and you don't know what pph is it's poker power hour and it's uh it's it's a zoom meeting on wednesday nights that we used to have that that were open to to the public where you know we just broke down hand histories and talk strat for for an hour and then pph got um gated behind the the paid course buyers so anyway john's 
doesn't know where he's disoriented right now. He's so excited about flatting easy. I of course get into in position that he doesn't know where he's at. Um so John Flats. Flop is six six seven. Two diamonds. There's four eighty in the pot. Villain has eight oh five. So everything is happening according to plan here. Would really expect Villain to be betting. Um maybe on an absolute basis. They bet about a fifth pot. I imagine that you're just going to call. Yep, sticking with the pre-flop plan here, <clears throat> giving them as much rope as possible to blast off, and that's pretty much what they do. They just go bet, bet. Yep, turn nine, they bet. Looks to be like another 20 percenter. You call, river's a six, so six, 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 seven, nine. What a great board for the preflop four better, huh? Tricks. Yeah, these are like the type of situations that I'm talking about where you get, you know, you get runouts like this where you're like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Like if he has value, he's getting stacked on this runout on this board texture. If he has a bluff, he's getting stacked on on this on this runout. And yep, as we see here, he does show up with a bluff. And yeah, old me would have just jammed aces preflop, and this guy would fold ace ten offsuit, and we all I would have done is picked up twenty four big blinds. New me post. Post preflop blue camp me is now stacking the ace ten offs and the king jack suiteds and still the kings and queens and jacks and all of those hands as well. But I think maybe the one like on this run out maybe the one thing that would be a little bit scary is uh, not stacking ace king sometimes, but they're less likely to have ace king when we have two aces anyway, so less of a concern. Yeah. Also, ace king may may just like could convince themselves to call in too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, brick diamonds. Look. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, hand number two. Look at that. You got aces again. You open the cutoff button, three bets. I imagine that you four bet. You do to 225. Villain calls. 465 in the pot. Villain has 790. You have them covered. So SPR is once again like 1.5. A little bit more than that. Flop is 753 rainbow. Yeah, lots of options here on the triple low board as well. Yeah, this hand gonna have involve a little bit more post flop strategy than the last one. Um, uh, so I think it's really hard for the button to find very many hands that they're gonna fold facing a C bet, a small small C bet on this board texture. They're either gonna have some sort of pair pair plus draw, you know, a hand like five six suited, six seven suited, eight nine suited, two overs and a gut shot, or they're just gonna have like two overs and a lot of their two overs type hands are gonna be suited. So they're a lot of the time they're gonna have two overs and a backdoor flush or a hands like. King Queen of Clubs, Queen Ten of Spades, you know, Ace Jack of Hearts, that type of stuff. So I think you can get almost every single hand in their range to continue if I bet small enough. Maybe the the hands that don't have a back or flush draw find folds, but that's that's going to be a small portion of their range relative to all the other hands that have a back or flush draw. Right. So for every King Queen of Diamonds that they fold, they're going to have King Queen of Hearts, King Queen of Spades, King Queen of Clubs. Um, Actually, so I decided to bet small here. Yeah, I think they probably just end up over defending with King Queen of Diamonds as well. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's really hard to. I mean, yeah, I I struggled to fold King Queen of Diamonds facing quarter pot in position. Yeah, so looks like you bet less than quarter, like twenty percent, twenty percent ish. Yeah, uh, villain calls. Turn is the deuce of hearts. So if your plan on the flop was to get villain to call with a hundred percent of their range. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that you're probably checking on the deuce of hearts. Nice. Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I think all those hands, those two over type hands are might start bluffing, but even if they don't bluff, again, we have SPR one, so we can easily get it in on the river if this this uh turn goes check check. Um really hoping that they do start turning most of those hands into bluffs though. Um not just the hard heart combos that have turned to flush draw now, but hopefully a whole bunch of, you know, a whole bunch of the other ones. And also, they could just end up value cutting themselves, right? They could just start, you know, betting with an over pair or some of their pair plus draw, pair, uh, yeah, pair plus draw type hands. Maybe a little it's, bit less, it's less a expected little, than a strong reg, but. It's a little bit the same as, you know, last week where I think that the hard, hard hands are actually going to be checking behind more than betting the, checking behind the turn more than betting the turn due yeah. to the fact that, like, King Queen of Hearts does does not want to bet like a quarter and get check jammed on, which they they have to imagine they will at, at some clip. So 
Yeah, like I actually think that like the bets here would be more from their like king queen of spades type hands, and gotcha. you know th those types of hands too is like they're drawing dead on the turn versus aces, so like letting them realize realize equity and like make top pair is like really good for for you in this in this case. So yeah, like I, I think I check, and if Dylan bets, then I'm just playing pure call and not check jamming. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly what happens here. <clears throat> Villain bet's very, very small on the turn, and instead of jamming, I decide to check call, keep all those hands that are drawing dead in their range. Um, again, I think there is a downside to this strategy, and that is that they are stabbing the turn with a hand that wants to check back the river, maybe a hand like pocket nines, pocket tens, you know, sure. that part of their range, and we're, you know, I don't even know if those hands necessarily always stack off if I check jam the turn, so it's not like we're always missing out on, on value from that part of range, but still... I think that part of the range is going to be relatively small compared to all the two overs type hands that um, that can stab the turn as a bluff. This river, little scary. I mean, five six and seven six now improved to two pair. Don't know how much stabbing they would do on the turn with those types of hands. They're kind of, in my mind, they're a little bit similar to the heart heart type hands that like they don't really want to get check jammed on um, on the turn. So maybe there is a little bit of dilution in, in that part of their range. Um, if Don't they have eight, eight nine, maybe. Oh yeah, eight nine. Yeah, okay. like you know, it's like eight eight nine suited. I think would be the would be like the one that I would be like most concerned about. Eight nine suited or like pocket sixes. I think would be the two, yeah. um, that improve on this river. Right? Like ace four is already a straight. I don't think they open the action with like four five suited. If they were to have four five suited or, um, you know, pocket fours, they probably shouldn't have. Uh, okay. Ace four is a straight. Um. So I actually think this river is like pretty blanky, uh, to be honest, where it looks a little scary because it's a four straight. So do straight five, six, seven is the final board, but I don't think it's actually that threatening. Like what, like basically if you're dead, I think you were already dead. You just didn't know it yet. And the yeah, six yeah. just, um, yeah. So you check fill in jams and was Maybe he cold. dead already and didn't know it? He was not. <laughs> he was very much alive. Villain has the jack ten of clubs. So really, really good sign that, you know, Villain opted to kind of go bananas um on this four straight run out. I, I also think like, yeah, it's for, for the Jack Ten of Clubs, like a lot of these times in, in spots like this where villains just kind of blast off with these types of hands. Just makes me like wonder, you know, like are are they really thinking about like what they're actually like repping when they just rip the river here? Or are they just repping or are they just like jamming to jam? Cause like holy cow, like 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 if you're thinking about their range when they bet the turn, you just realize quite quickly that like, oh, it's just like really hard for them to have very good hands here. Um So anyway, just like that that was just like an aside, an observation. That like, if you have ace king here, you know, you should probably just be check calling the turn and then check calling all in on the river, realizing that like, oh, like villain just, how do they have a four? They just, it's just like very, very, very difficult for them to have a four unless they have ace four suited. Yeah. I mean, I'll admit that I'm also guilty of sometimes, or not sometimes, but very frequently over bluffing and just being like, oh, look, I can, I can rip a straight here. Like, ah, uh -huh. like they, you know, sure. they never have a four, et cetera, and, and going crazy too, so. Uh, I'm 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 a, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to the to the Jack Ten High Blasters than <laughs> than, than you are. I think though, though like in, on a more serious note, the one of the big takeaways from this episode I think should be something that you coach quite frequently in the Wolves, and that's a lot of the times the the best spots to check are the spots that feel like the most slam dunk bet spots. So even pre flop with the aces, right? It feels like a slam dunk just jam, or or on the surface it looks like that. Where it's just like, yeah, dude, I have the nuts pre flop and this guy four bet. Like, let's just, you know, let's put all the money sure. in. in this spot. It's like, oh, I have an over pair on the turn. I have like the best over pair I can have. Like, I should just bet the turn and get value from, um, you know, whatever their bluff catchers are. And yeah, I think there's like, there's really something to be said about like, hey, like when you have a hand that seems like a slam dunk bet or a slam dunk jam, um, you should consider checking and giving your opponent room to blast off with hands that can call the jam in this case and and in the previous hand with ace-10 and still feel comfortable that you're going to stack a lot of the hands that um, you're targeting with a jam anyways. Um, so, yeah, I think there's 
especially when, you know, usually it is when you have super strong hands that don't need any type of protection and don't really care about the street getting checked through, for example, with, with aces. But yeah, finding these checks is, um, I think, a, a big, big part of, of having a high win rate at, at six max fashion element. Yeah, can't, can't agree enough. Um, so I, I also think too, by the way, like, but before we go that, that there's something, you know, that's, it's been a big shift in how I teach poker over the past like year, two years. But like speaking of like the, you know, the Jack 10, not really repping very much when they jam the river, but jamming on the four liner anyway, um, like just having a clear thought process and a, a clear understanding of like what your strategy is. And like maybe um, villains will overfold facing this jam, right? Where Jack 10 can get rewarded for over bluffing, right? Like all, all the over cards with back doors that just call the flop see bad and then blast a turn, jam the river on the four straight, like potentially, right? But I think also you just kind of need to be aware that like somebody that's actually thinking about the situation cleanly um, is really able to passively exploit you just by calling wider. Um, calling your 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 turn bet and then calling the river follow up much wider in these spots when like realistically speaking you just have a very very narrow value range and that that's a thing that's like really easy to take advantage of if um you know you're, you're hand reading and and just recognize how little value the in position player has. Yeah, I totally agree with that, and yeah, it's something that. Um... That's definitely a skill that I've, I've, I think, gotten a lot better at under under your coaching and just being like, hey, like this board is really scary, but it's actually not as scary as it looks because the value that they're repping is extremely, extremely narrow, especially in a in, in a format plot and on a on a low board. Um, how well can they connect with a board texture like this? So yeah, yeah, cool, good stuff, great episode. That's all I got. See you next week. See you next week. If you enjoyed today's Tactical Tuesday episode on winning the max with your pocket aces, please make sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel. Helps us out a lot and lets us know what type of content you'd like to see in the future. Thanks again for watching this week's episode of Tactical Tuesday. This is Tactical Tuesday on Chasing Poker Greatness with your hosts, Brad Wilson and John Chai. Coach Brad approved. Are you a lone wolf searching for the ultimate pack? The CPG Wolf Program is a close-knit brotherhood hell-bent on one thing only, chasing poker greatness. Powered by Bleeding Edge Wolf Strats and led by Coach Brad and his lieutenants, CPG Wolves are systematically prepared for almost any spot they'll encounter on the green felt. If you want to plug into an elite team and have a step-by-step -step game plan to realize your full poker potential, you can apply at cpgwolves.com. Space is limited, and the pack is only as strong as its weakest member. So only the hungriest, grittiest, and most driven will be accepted into the program. Applications are open at cpgwolves.com.